Aphex Twin is one of those artists that needs no introduction. The name alone arguably carries the same impact on electronic music as, say, The Beatles does for rock and roll. And over the years, he's put out a huge amount of groundbreaking albums under God knows how many different monikers. Within that massive body of work, however, one album stands out. On this one, there are no glitchy beats or acid lines to make our brain dance, and no signature grin on the cover. Instead, we have nearly three hours of introspective, textured ambient, sometimes warm and beautifully soothing, other times cold, eerie, and outright frightening, just like the world of dreams in which the album was supposedly made. I'm talking, of course, about Selected Ambient Works Volume 2. So, how was this record made? Why was it divisive? And what can Mr. Richard D. James teach us about creativity? I just, I don't know, I, I get a bit scared sometimes because um, I just get too many ideas and that's where my only problem comes in, really. Half genius, half mad scientist, Richard James has gone from tinkering with synthesizers and building instruments to having his unique ideas and production techniques go on to influence a myriad of artists, not only in electronic music, but also in popular music as a whole. And when it comes to making music, the man is simply a machine. Already in the 90s, he claimed to make as many as four tracks a day and to have unreleased material to fill over 200 LPs. If there's one thing to be certain of, it's that Aphex Twin loves to make music for the pure joy of it. Our DJ grew up in Cornwall, in an isolated community as far away from the British music scene as you can get, and he apparently started making music out of sheer boredom. I got myself motivated to do this. I just loved creating things and making things. I could just lock myself away for days and get inspired by myself. It's more like a pure form of motivation when it's all on your own. But you have to wait until you're really bored and you've got nothing to do. That's when it comes out. That's when I reckon it gets good. In his late teens, James gained traction DJing at local raves. Initially reluctant to release any of his music, one night, on acid, his mates finally convinced him to put out his first EP, Analog Bubble Bath, and shortly after followed several more. In late 1992, the world finally saw the release of Aphex Twin's first studio album, Selected Ambient Works 85-92, more or less a compilation of tracks from James's youth, with the oldest made in his early teens. The album proved to be a total game-changer for electronic music. While artists like the KLF and the Orb had already fused ambient techno and house, the blend was truly perfected on this album. A rave record for the bedroom rather than the dance floor, it consists of 13 tracks of amazing bass lines, catchy melodies and lush atmospheres. Brilliantly sequenced, no filler, no bullshit. Some of my favorite Aphex tracks are on here, and despite its technical flaws, in my opinion, the album's ideas and execution still sound ahead of their time to this day. And you want to know the most fascinating thing? They were just tracks that my mates selected, ones that they liked to chill out to. They weren't the tracks I would have selected, they're more lightweight ones. When I chill out, I go to a different level, basically. Chilling out for me involves being monged out of your head, sitting somewhere totally wasted, basically. Ambient Works 2 is the stuff I prefer to listen to. So I expressed a very strong interest in putting the stuff out, which uh, I just thought they were going to think, oh, this f***ing artist, you know, this not Aphex Twin, he's a pain in the arse, he wants to do triple albums and not call any, put any track titles on his albums and things like that, and I just thought they were going to go mental, but they've been really cool about it all, actually. After Ambient Works 85-92 to was met with acclaim and pretty much hailed as the dark side of the moon of the 90s, expectations sure were high going into Aphex Twin's second album, Selected Ambient Works Volume 2, or Saw 2. Marketed as a sequel to the debut, it's not hard to understand why people expected something in the same vein. But James had other plans. 
far removed from the lush techno of its predecessor, Saw 2 takes the listener on a haunting, mostly beatless, auditory journey that conjures vivid images of the vastness of space, desolate oceans, dark forests, futuristic cities, and even alien worlds. It's an album full of mystery and imagination to completely immerse yourself in on a night of heavy rain showers and power outages. At the time, this change in direction wasn't entirely met with praise, and it divided both critics and fans alike. That's fine, but before criticizing, it's important to emphasize the ambient in selected ambient works. If people were disappointed because they thought the sound of the first record was considered ambient, they're kind of missing the mark. In fact, on this second release, James gets much closer to the actual definition of ambient music, as coined by Brian Eno back in the 70s. Eno famously aimed to make unintrusive music that was as ignorable as it is interesting. I made another video about Brian Eno and the birth of ambient music if you're interested. It's a fascinating story. Anyway, the point is that Unlike its predecessor, Ambient Works 2 very much relates to the works of Eno, and actually reminds me quite a bit of his album Apollo, both sharing a similar eerie, otherworldly tone. As a curious side note, James, on the other hand, doesn't seem to take the term seriously at all. It's pretty funny really, I don't like the word, but I use it on my own records. I didn't care really when I used it. It made me laugh to think that I'd call something with a word that I don't actually like. At the end of the day, I don't care what anything is called. It's just whether I like it or not. But enough about that. What's actually on this thing music-wise? Well, there's a lot of music on here. Nearly three hours in fact. And just to be clear, I won't try to decipher anything or look for meaning where there is none. It's a well-known fact that James finds it useless trying to analyze his music, which is one of the reasons why he often gives his tracks cryptic titles with random words, numbers and anagrams. On Saw 2, however, James takes it one step further, not giving the 25 tracks any names at all, only a number corresponding to the order. The album kicks off with, you guessed it, number one, also known as Cliffs. Here, James layers a vocal sample over a three chord progression drenched in reverb. The sample comes and goes, enters and fades out, giving an almost lullaby-like effect. And the track instantly sets the tone of the album as somewhere in between beautiful and eerie, comforting and ominous. One of the most intriguing aspects of Ambient Works 2 is that James supposedly made it while practicing lucid dreaming. And for those who don't know, a lucid dream is one where the dreamer realizes they're dreaming and therefore gains some control over the dream itself. James would apparently write music in his dreams and then try to recreate it when awake, making him in a sense some sort of musical dream traveler, collecting sounds from other states of consciousness and bringing them back. He had this to say about it. About a year and a half ago, I badly wanted to dream tracks. Like imagine I'm in the studio and write a track in my sleep, wake up and then write it in the real world with real instruments. The hardest thing is getting the sounds the same. It's never the same. When you have a nightmare or a weird dream, you wake up and tell someone about it and it sounds really shit. It's the same for sounds, roughly. When I imagine sounds, they are in dream form. As you get better at doing it, you can get closer and closer to the actual sounds. Whether this is true or just a load of horse sh**, who knows? James has a well-known reputation for taking the piss out of the press. But for the sake of argument, let's say that's how it happened. In that case, there really must have been a divine intervention somewhere, because the sounds James collected for track number 3, also known as Rhubarb, are among the most beautiful ever, and what I imagine hearing while ascending to heaven. Throughout the record, James has an uncanny ability to make electronics sound strangely organic, and rhubarb is no exception. Here, James miraculously makes his cold machines sound like wailing flutes, 
or some kind of ancient interdimensional wind instrument. Truly an existential track that evokes in me the same feeling as standing alone gazing at the night sky. Rhubarb is so full of life and wonder and melancholy and loss and hope and loneliness and pain and joy. A track encapsulating the whole emotional spectrum of what it means to be human. And when it ends, you feel so small yet so complete, drained and rejuvenated at the same time. Now, you might be wondering why the untitled tracks are also known as something else. Well, it has to do with the album art. On the records, we find cryptic photographs representing the tracks. Based on the photos, back in the early days of the internet, dedicated fans assigned unofficial names that still stick to this day. For instance, take the one we just heard, Rhubarb, or the one before that, Cliffs. In reality though, most of the photographs were just from James's flat, unassuming things like radiators and bits of metal. But how did the fans know which image corresponded to which track? Eh, it's complicated. Here's designer Paul Nicholson. On first viewing, they're just rounded off boxes for photographs with these little pie charts in there. But all of these pie charts and the size of the photograph related to the track signatures, how long they were. The 25 tracks had the time code converted into decimal, then the full time for each side, then as a percentage of the total, and then as a degree. That was uh, quite a process. Segwaying back to the music, for the remainder of the album, James continues to walk the line between the eerie and beautiful, the comforting and ominous. Note the striking contrast between the apocalyptic mood of number 10. and the narcotic bliss of number 20. Or the nightmarish alien squeals of number 16. And the gentle passing of time on stone in focus. To sum up, Ambient Works 2 paints strikingly vivid soundscapes to be totally transfixed by, preferably lying down on your bed with headphones and in pitch darkness. It's an album that takes the listener on an extremely rewarding journey for those willing to take the time. Some might argue that three hours is pushing it, but to them I would say that Saw 2 isn't a traditional album per se. Rather than trying to impose a lyrical message or a narrative, it's a record meant to evoke whatever's hiding deep inside you, a different kind of music experience, in the same way as, say, 2001 A Space Odyssey is a different kind of film experience. All in all, Ambient Works 2 is a piece of art that has followed me closely since my teens, and I will keep coming back to it for as long as I live. Selected Ambient Works 2 was released in March of 94, and despite the initial criticism, in retrospect, it has gone on to become one of James's most celebrated works, even clinching second place in Pitchfork's list of the greatest ambient albums of all time. From not wanting to release records at all, to letting his friends choose the tracks once he does, James builds his instruments, titles his albums with words he doesn't even like, and most likely has months of unreleased music that will never see the light of day. He's a true source of inspiration for creative people everywhere, and a reminder that what matters most is the act of creating. With Ambient Works 2, James did the total opposite of what was expected of him, because in the end he makes music for only one person, himself. So what can we learn from Aphex Twin? Simply do whatever it is that you love for the pure joy of it, and pursue your passion without thinking of anybody other than yourself. Because as creative people, we have to create, no matter what, otherwise we wither and die. But be careful not to get distracted. Remember, Richard D. James, one of the greatest electronic music composers of all time, got started out of boredom. And maybe what's sorely lacking in today's modern world of constant stimulation is that we simply aren't bored enough. <laughs>